Hello, everyone, and welcome to our second of four community forums. Uh, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, we are providing these forums to share an update of the college's plans for the summer and fall semesters. Uh, so with us today are a few of our campus leaders. My name is Alicia Crow. I'm the Vice President of College Advancement, and I'll be facilitating the session today and reading your questions aloud. If you do have questions, please send them on the chat feature online. You can either do a chat or you can do a private message to us uh, to ask your question. If we are unable to answer your question directly this evening, we encourage you to send us in a private message your contact information, either your phone number or your email, and one of our team members will follow up with you with the answers that you seek for your question. Um, tonight, we are recording the session so that we can provide it, a link to the session later um, for folks who are unable to attend. Also, I would encourage you, um, if you're interested, to attend um, the session on Thursday or on Friday if you're able. There may be different questions that other people think of. Or if you think of a question between now and then, I encourage you to um, join the session. Or um, you can also message us um, online and send us uh, the, the question that you have. We do have a variety of questions that have been emailed to us ahead of time. So I'll be reading those questions as well as reading the questions as you submit them online to us this evening. Uh, I think that's all that I have for housekeeping details. So at this time, I will turn it over to Dr. Jeff Raffin, uh, college president of NWTC. Thank you, Alicia, and welcome to all of you. And if you're eating dinner, uh, I hope you're having a good dinner. Uh, I'm just sitting here hungry, but that's Alicia's fault. <laughs> Anyways, I'm glad to uh, be able to welcome you to this webcast and to answer questions that you might have. I know that a number of you uh, and many of us are wondering what is going to happen in education, both in the summer and in the fall, uh, particularly because of this COVID pandemic. And we've all heard various rumors and various things, that colleges and universities that are gonna offer everything online or uh, colleges that aren't going to open until later. Or, and, you know, some of them are, are just, you know, uh, perhaps going to do nothing and ignore it. Um, the bottom line is, is that, you know, there's a lot of uncertainty. But at NWTC, I want to assure you that we know that our roots are in providing hands-on education. And yes, it's true that the last eight weeks of the semester in the spring, we moved to online. We really had no choice because, of course, we were closed. Um, and I must say that our um, faculty and our students did a phenomenal job of finishing up their semester, or a few of them are currently finishing it up right now. And I wanna thank them for the great work that they did and the creativity that they showed to make sure that um, you students and that the and were able to finish uh, their program. Um, and I'm looking forward to recognizing them in the virtual graduation that we have coming up. That said, what is going to happen in the summer and what's going to happen in the fall? Honestly, many of you, you know, you did it, you persisted, um, or many of you now that have come out of high school or, or have um, been taking uh, courses in other forms, have done it online, you may not have really liked it that much. And I know some are sitting by and wondering, well, what's gonna happen at NWTC? So let me tell you. Um, we're gonna have basically three different uh, notations when you come to register for our programs. One is called in-person. And essentially what that means is that most of your program is going to be offered right here on campus. As I said, we are a hands-on institution. Uh, that means that you're going to be learning by using the tools and using the mechanisms, using the various opportunities that we have here in order to learn how to do that work. I don't know about you, but I'm not really excited about having somebody, you know, clean my teeth uh, without having actually worked on a real person or fixing my automobile without actually seeing a real automobile and just reading about it in a book. One of the things that employers tell us over and over again that they like about our students is that you've been using the tools and the equipment and solving problems and working together as teams before you even get to their place of employment. And that we wanna make sure you are able to continue to do. How are we gonna do that in a COVID-19 environment? Well, that's where the creativity comes in. We're gonna to have to maintain some physical distance and we'll 
Actually, I'll talk a little bit more about some of the other things that we'll do. But the most important thing is, is that we will have you on our campuses um, or in our regional learning centers learning to do this work. Those are mostly the programs that will require that kind of laboratory experience. We will be offering courses also in a blended format. And by blended, what we mean is, is that some of that coursework will occur off campus, um, maybe at your home, maybe in some other location, and then the other part of it will happen on campus. I can assure you that every course that we offer will have at least one day a week on campus, and usually for one, two, or three hours at least. <clears throat> now, the only ones that would not be in that situation, of course, the ones that we have historically always offered online. In that particular case, those online courses will continue to be offered, and you will be able to access them and pursue your education on your timetable and when you can do it. Many of our online courses, even this past spring, and much of our blended, has actually happened in a way in which you are participating synchronously or all at once. In other words, it might be on a webcast just like this. You see your classmates, you talk to them, and you interact with them. You may even be able to work with them in teams. One of the things that I learned over this last spring is, is that I could do that online. And they would sometimes put me in another room, even though I wasn't physically in that room, in order to work on a team activity and then come back to the larger activity. There are creative ways to do this so that you're working uh, with folks. And if you're one of those people like me who procrastinate or need more structure, a synchronous program actually allows that to happen because you have a specific time you come on and participate in an online format or in this video format. Remember, though, that in those blended courses, you will be doing part of it off campus, but also part of it on campus at least one day a week you will be on campus now that's one day a week for your program for your course that you're taking so if you're taking multiple courses you might find yourself on campus more than that one day um, a week but we want to make sure that you're able to engage with other students so we have these three types in person blended and online and we know that you will be um, successful in one or more of those we have a lot of support that we provide students because our number one goal is for you to succeed. And that support can be provided uh, through our academic coaches. They'll be provided by our advisors. It's provided by our admissions counselors. It's provided by our um, career centers. It's provided by our emergency fund. It's provided by food that we provide and counseling. We don't want to have anything stop you and get in your way from being successful. And so if you find yourself at some point struggling in one or more of these methods, you will be able uh, to get the support that you need. And we are watching out for you. So sometimes when you're maybe just a little nervous about asking for help, we're going to try to figure out that you need that help now and get that help to you. So that's something that we look forward to. Now, one of the things that I know some people are doing is they're wondering, well, I'm just going to wait and see uh, what happens. And, and maybe at the last moment, I'll enroll. And I wanted to assure you that we have implemented, as of today, a no-risk enrollment program. Reserve your spot. I don't want you to be in a situation where, you know, you get almost at a time when a program or a course is going to start and then find out you can't get the course that you want. Go ahead and register for that course. Sign up for that. Get ready to do that. But you don't have to pay us until at least five days into that course and we'll make sure you get your books, you don't have to pay for those, or your tools, at least for five days within that course. And if you find out that eh, things aren't the way you thought they were going to be, or maybe something happens and COVID, you know, erupts and becomes a much bigger problem again, um, you're going to be able to leave that course with no penalty, um, no record. Um, it's not going to affect your future financial aid. Uh, you won't have paid us any money, so we won't give you have any money to give you back. But if you would rather pay ahead of time, I don't know, like I like to just get the bills out of the way, go ahead and do that. We will return those funds to you, no questions asked. This is our no-risk enrollment program. You don't have to worry about being trapped or tied into something 
that you find out that you really didn't want or don't like because things changed. We know the times are uncertain. We want to take the risk away uh, from you, and we'll take that risk that you'll sign up. We're committed to making sure that we deliver these courses in a way that you want them. I know that you will want them. I know that you'll be successful. But if for some reason something happens, whether it be with COVID or be something else in your life, um, you'll be able to leave that course at no risk. One of the best ways to find out how things are going and how to make this happen is go onto our website, nwtc.edu. Um, right there, it's scrolling right across the top is the banner that says, click here and it will get you into our no risk enrollment program um, that you can partic then participate and sign up for. Looking forward to seeing you, hope to see you soon, whether it be this summer or in the fall. But at this point, I will be glad to take any questions that you might have, um, and my esteemed group of panelists will be able to make sure that either one, I give you the right answer, or two, give you the right answer while I try to keep quiet. All right, so just a reminder, if you have a question, go ahead and type that in the chat feature. It's usually on the top right side of your screen. We do have our first question that has been typed in, and that is, is the campus going to be open for the fall term? Absolutely, the campus will be open for the fall term. Remember, we are a hands-on campus. This is what the technical education is about. And you will have the opportunity to actually work um, and learn uh, hands-on. Um, this one was sent in. If in-person classes will be held in the fall, will class sizes be limited? Yes, actually, we will make sure that you are in a healthy environment. This is most important to us. It's important both for our employees and staff to remain healthy, and it's important for our students to remain healthy. There are basically three things uh, that we will be doing in order to make sure that that uh, stays the case. One is, is that we will be asking all students and all employees to wear masks. The second thing is, is that we will um, be uh, engaging in cleaning on a regular basis and after classes, making sure that the rooms and the places that you be are constantly uh, clean. And the, the, the third thing is, which I'm forgetting at the moment. Physical distancing. Thank you, the physical distancing. You know, it is six o'clock. I haven't had my dinner yet, but at any rate, um, physical distancing, it's gonna be important that we maintain that six feet of physical distancing. And that's what's going to more or less determine how many people we can have in a classroom or in a laboratory. We are currently in a process of going through all of our rooms on all of our sites and making sure that they are sized in order to be able to accommodate this social distancing. That means that a classroom that perhaps held 18 or 24 people may now only be able to hold 12 people. If that's the case, then we're only going to put 12 people in that classroom. Um, and then we'll, we'll have to schedule another class to take the remaining people or the other 12 or however many are still waiting to get into that course um, or into that program. So we're not going to stop you from getting into the courses, but we are going to make sure that you are in space that allows for the physical distancing that needs to happen. We will also be trying to help you stay in the building where you will get most, if not all, of your courses. And that way, by limiting how many people are moving around all of the time, we hope to uh, therefore limit the transmission of any virus that may exist or that somebody may bring into the campus. What if you know you are exposed to COVID-19 because of working with positive patients? Will that affect your schooling? Certainly, if you know that you're exposed to COVID, we will be following the CDC uh, requirements and we would ask that you uh, self-quarantine. Um, the important part of that, however, is, is that we will make accommodations uh, for you so that you can come back when you're done with the self-quarantine. And Of course, depending on the exposure, that could be anywhere from three days to even possibly two weeks. But we will make the accommodations so that you can finish up your coursework um, and continue on with your education. As you probably know, uh, many of our courses are moving to an eight-week format, which also gives us additional flexibility because if for some reason 
um, you're out for a more extended period of time, you'll have the opportunity to continue and finish up that course perhaps in the next eight week session without getting behind by a year or a full semester. I think Catherine has a follow up comment to that. Yeah, thank you. Um, thanks, Dr. Reffin. My name is Catherine Orgalski. I'm the Vice President for Learning. And one of the things that we have been working with students who are in health and public safety fields, um, we have screening questions to help students that if you are exposed to COVID-19, but you're wearing the proper PPE because that's part of your job, uh, we have different protocols for you. So we're working uh, on on variety of scenarios and situations to make sure that we're keeping students safe. But if that's part of the work you're doing, um, that doesn't mean that you can't come to class. We will work with you on how to uh, maintain safety while doing your job. Thank you, Catherine. I mean, you know, we, we, we highly value, of course, those folks who are out there serving us as essential workers and making sure and taking care of those people who may have had COVID or been exposed to COVID. We certainly won't be penalized for that. In fact, we might even ask you to help us teach the class on that particular issue. Will the semester calendar remain the same or are you considering ending the semester early? Example, not returning to campus after Thanksgiving. No, we uh, at this point are expecting to have our eight week semester. So there, there actually will be two different kinds of calendars moving simultaneously or in parallel. Some students will be, about half the students, will be in eight-week courses, which means they're going to start, um, they're going to finish up their eight weeks, it's a week break, and then they're going to start the next eight weeks. Both of those eight-week sessions are over by the time uh, the holidays roll around, or the, the, certainly the Christmas holidays um, roll around. And then some of you will still be in 15-week semesters, um, and those will end at their regular time that you may be used to, or certainly if this is your first year on campus, um, they're usually ending by about the middle of December. Uh, so we'll have both of those going on, but we will we do expect uh, that classes will be in place uh, through the Thanksgiving holiday. Will the building be open this summer for students and summer classes for individual studying or small group studying? Um, not not really not i mean if if necessary in a particular course or program um, that will be provided for within the context of the course um, but if you're talking about um, uh, work outside of that course uh, that needs to be done we will be helping you do that uh, through the use of a uh, technology like webex or our learning management system blackboard again you'll be able to interact with students in real time um, and work on your team projects in real time. Uh, frankly, it's uh, an opportunity to learn also how to do that kind of work in a remote, because a lot of work in the future is going to be done uh, remotely as well. Will students be required to be tested or vaccinated before returning to campus? No, the, the, the information uh, that's out there on testing um, is mixed at best, um, and we've decided not to do that. Um, really, you could be symptomatic without even having a fever. Um, so we're going to rely on those three methods, um, the masks, uh, the physical spacing, and the cleaning, and of course, the hand washing. I should mention that. We do have sanitizing stations throughout all of our campuses and our sites. And frankly, if you do those things, um, that will uh, probably do, do the job. Now, I know wearing a mask isn't fun. Um, I'm not particularly excited about it myself, but the data seems to strongly indicate that by wearing a mask, you are protecting others. Um, for instance, if you are, have COVID, you're asymptomatic, you don't know that, um, you are 70% less likely to pass that on. And frankly, if you're wearing a mask and the person and the other person is wearing a mask, you're 5%, only 5% likely to get that uh, particular um, COVID virus. So, of course, uh, we want to encourage the mask wearing in order to protect yourself and to protect those uh, around you. But we do not believe taking the temperatures uh, is an issue. And of course, vaccinations, we don't have a vaccine yet that works. Um, and I suspect we won't throughout the course of this coming year. 
If I cannot attend class because I'm ill, will that affect my grades? Will teachers be understanding and provide options? Well, one of the things that we're really committed to is making sure you're successful. <laughs> and we're not going to let your illness get in the way of your success. And so our faculty and our staff are really good at working with you creatively and coming up with a way to catch up, make up that work, or even in some cases do that work after the semester or the eight-week session ends. And what's most important is that you're able to learn, but we don't want you to come on campus if you're not feeling well, if you're sick. Um, that's not going to help you and it's not going to help other people on this campus. So in no way should you feel pressure to come if you're feeling sick, because we will work with you to make sure you're successful. Will there be food service on campus? Uh, unfortunately, we will not be providing uh, food service through the commons uh, where you can, uh, you know, get lunch meals either in buffet style or salad. We will, however, put vending machines in every single one of our buildings, so you will have that opportunity. Frankly, we can't provide that food service and at the same time ensure the physical distancing that would need to occur in a space that large uh, as you come down for dinner. So. Hopefully you can uh, bring food to eat, you can eat in class, you can use the vending machines, um, and then we'll see where it goes. I mean, well, that's what the first semester will look like, or at least through December, and uh, then depending on the COVID, we'll, we'll determine what we will do in January. Will there be study abroad next year? No, unfortunately, there won't be study abroad. Um, frankly, it's... The times are so uncertain. We're not sure what's going to be happening in other countries. Um, we've already experienced students that were abroad, uh, perhaps having some trouble getting back uh, into the country. Um, certainly in terms of international students coming here, visas at the moment are being uh, denied. Um, so we're going to have to take a break in this coming year from our study abroad um, in our international recruiting. We'll be taking that opportunity to look at ways in which we can incorporate some of those experiences, at least some of that knowledge in our courses, and really setting ourselves up. So once that vaccine gets here, uh, hopefully a year from now, uh, we'll be able to get right back into the study abroad opportunities. Will the library, will the library be open? Yeah, of course, the library resources are so much of those are online right now uh, that you can access the library um, from almost anywhere uh, at any time. Uh, however, uh, we are looking at plans as to how we will be able to get you back and forth from your building uh, to the library. Um, but of course, there'll be less seating in the library because we're going to need to maintain the physical distancing. Um, but we will be there in order to help you uh, be able to participate in. Of course, we have study rooms there. Um, we'll have to make sure that, that, again, in those study rooms, we have a proper physical distancing. So if you, you know, those, uh, what, what did they used to do when you were in, uh, in college back in the old days when I was there, you try to figure out how many people you get in a, you know, a little Volkswagen bug. Well, you know, if you're trying to figure out how many people you can get in one of those study rooms at a time, you may have to wait a year to do that. Uh, we'll just be a couple of people we can probably put in there at a time. Is the bookstore going to be open this summer? No, the bookstore will primarily deliver books to you um, by mail um, at our cost, of course. Um, and when you register for a course, we'll be able to tell you what books you're going to need and we'll be able to make arrangements for those books to be delivered to you. Is the intramural program canceled for the fall semester? Well, um, you know, intramural sports, uh, I'm, I think I'm going to have to kind of demur on that. Um, I don't, I, I would suspect a lot of the team sports may not happen. Um, at the same time, we know that keeping students engaged in activities outside of the class um, is also extremely important. One, it creates a better connection to the college. It helps you find friends and peers that can help you study. Um, and that's always important. And there are things that you can learn, um, the leadership skills, team building skills. And so we'll be looking for different ways in which to engage you in activities throughout the campus. Um, but intramural sports may be a little difficult, again, because of COVID. 
Will counseling services be available? You know, we have actually professional counselors uh, here on campus, um, and they have been providing services uh, through telecounseling uh, during this time when people couldn't be on campus, uh, but they will be doing that uh, in the future as well, but also in a face-to-face -face format. Um, these counselors are trained and licensed to help you with um, various issues that might stand in your way of being successful, whether it be uh, a mental illness such as depression or anxiety, um, or whether it be uh, other kinds of uh, barriers such as drug and alcohol abuse or things going on in your home that are getting in your way. Uh, these are things that we do not want to have stop you from being successful. And so we provide these services to you uh, so that you can continue to be successful. And we will continue to have those available. How is the college handling campus cleaning if a COVID case is on campus? Well, there are certain protocol that we're uh, called upon to use and that we will have implemented. Um, at the very least, uh, that space that has where that student has been uh, will be shut down probably for about three days. Um, and uh, on that third day, uh, right about that time, there'll be some very deep cleaning going on and every surface will be um, the scrub down uh, with uh, high potency antiviral product uh, that will make sure that that space is still safe uh, for students to come back in and use. It's also part of the reason why we're trying to limit how much mobility students have on the campus. Um, if you go everywhere on the campus and it turns out that um, for whatever reason, heaven forbid, that you had ended up having COVID, you can imagine how difficult that it would be then uh, for us to clean the whole campus and shut it all down. So we want to make sure that we have a good idea where our students are uh, so that we can take the proper steps to ensure the health of all students that are on the campus. Um, we have a confirmation question. Do you plan to have the campus open this fall term then? Yes, the campus will be open on the fall term. Um, it will be open to all students and all prospective students um, and their families or parents. I, we do not expect that it will be open to the general public. Will the gym be closed or open for a limited number of people at one time? Uh, unfortunately, at least through this, uh, the end of this uh, calendar year, the gym will be closed. It's just not possible for us to keep it in a condition where we feel we can safely provide uh, for its use. Um, however, there are some classes that use that gym for training, particularly like in public safety or uh, um, the wellness program, for instance. Um, and of course, they will have access to that gym for those specific activities, and then we'll have to deep clean it. Are campus visits available for prospective students? Um, I'm going to let Alicia answer that in a second. I will tell you that we have some really cool um, online uh, campus tours and campus visits, um, but we, uh, I believe, are also going to be in a position to be able to allow some of that to occur as well. Do you want to speak to that, Alicia? Sure. Um, our college recruitment team has been working on a plan for the fall semester to allow for on-campus tours, and it may look different than it has in the past, obviously keeping in mind the requirements that Dr. Raffin mentioned with respect to wearing masks, physical distancing, as well as campus cleaning. Uh, so we may have um, more individual tours. Um, we may limit the number of people who can be touring in a group. Obviously, it will be based on the current recommendations at that time for safety. Uh, but we do want students who are interested to be able to see the program areas that they're interested in. So we may also be limiting to touring the space where a student would have a class at least within the next year. Um, but as Dr. Raffin mentioned, we already have online uh, multiple virtual tours. And very soon we will have online and available uh, virtual reality tours where you can actually feel like you are standing in that, that part of the classroom or the lab. Um, and those experiences will be available in the very near future. So there'll be lots of opportunities for students to be able to see our physical space on campus. Uh, maybe not all of them will exactly will be in person, uh, but we are trying to make a plan for that to happen. Alicia, um, let me just ask you, what if I wanted to go on a tour this summer because I haven't decided whether or not to come this fall? Um, I would encourage you to reach out to us um, and uh, try to get one of those scheduled. 
uh, we can definitely talk about ways that we can make that happen. First, we would start with the virtual tour, um, but also as we continue to make our plans uh, for who can be on campus and when, we can work out um, a time for a person to, um, again, probably most likely individually to be able to be on campus. So if you're a high school student and you've been working with one of our career coaches, please reach out to your career coach. If you are not a high school student and you haven't been working with one of our staff members, we encourage you to reach out to us. Um, you could uh, actually maybe someone else on the team would want to talk about if you're an adult who they could reach out to. Uh, probably the easiest way to get a hold of anyone on campus is to go to nwtc.edu and click on the chat with us button. And instantaneously, you'll be connected with somebody who can help answer your questions. Um, we also have the phone number for the call center, which I am not currently remembering, but I know there's someone on this call who knows that number and can share it. Is that going to be Mark? I think Aaron's going Is to. Is Aaron going to? Yes, Aaron. Aaron, you're up. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Alicia. Um, thank you. I'm Aaron DeGrand from Admissions and Enrollment here at NWTC, and we currently have a virtual quick start going on. So like Alicia said, you can log on to our website and you are able to chat with somebody right now regarding what it's like to get started here at NWTC. Um, also, our phone number here is 920-498-5444. Um, that's for if you don't know who to connect with or maybe you don't have internet access at home, we can help you submit that application over the phone and get you started this fall. You know, Dan, uh, Dan Minchef is our CIO or our Chief Information Officer, and you know, all of this talk about using technology, what if I don't have this technology at home or I frankly can't afford to pay that 60 bucks a month in order to have internet? Well, that's a great question. Um, good after, good evening, everyone. Uh, we are working really hard with our library to make laptops and cellular hotspots available to students that need them. Um, so that works really well if you're in an area uh, where you have good cellular connectivity, but can't afford um, to pay for, say, uh, a cable access or whatnot. So we're working with, we're working on that, and we're also um, working on uh, with local community leaders to help extend out rural broadband. Although that might not be ready by the fall, we are um, making hardware available out of our mind. Yeah, and I want to reassure you, those who um, don't have access to the internet uh, for one reason or another, that we will work with you um, as uh, faculty uh, and as staff, making sure that you're getting the materials that others are getting um, and are able to use that. So it may be in paper form, it may be in some other format, or you may want to go to one of our regional learning centers where you can then access the internet there and participate in the courses and classes that we have. Remember, we have regional learning centers. Um, uh, we have one in Krivitz, we have one in Aurora, we have um, Shawano, we have Ocano Falls, we have Luxembourg, we have Sister Bay, um, and then we have campuses in Sturgeon Bay and, and as well as Marinette. Um, so frankly, uh, if you don't have access uh, to the internet, um, that's no excuse. Uh, we're, we've got you covered. Uh, just come on in or, um, you know, give us a call. Uh, that's why we have that call center and they can walk you through every step that you need to go through. What campus services are available remotely? Actually, every service that we offer to our students is also available um, remotely. So whether it be um, those student services like academic coaching, um, you may not be aware of it, but we actually keep track of how students are doing in their courses. And if we see that a student is beginning to get into trouble, um, maybe they had a really poor test grade or, or maybe they missed a, a few classes, um, we will make a referral to our academic advising and uh, they'll work with you. And I'm, in fact, I'm going to ask Erica Wade just to talk a little bit about what happens in academic advising. Um, and are you going to be a help or are you just going to be a pain and nag me all the time? Oh, <laughs> thanks, Dr. Affin. My name is Erica Wade. I'm the academic advising manager. And honestly, your academic advisor is really your first contact as a student here. So when you're getting started, you'll work with a few different people that 
are assigned to you. Once you start your classes, everyone who's in one of our programs gets an academic advisor who's really your coach. They help you come up with an academic plan so you know what to take every semester. They can help you get connected to resources, answer questions, help you explore more of what the college has to offer. So we are here for our students all of the time. Students are never a burden to us. We look forward to hearing from our students and making connections and seeing you graduate. And then, of course, we offer uh, coaching to students or tutoring. Uh, some of you may think of it as that. But we always like to tell people that um, you shouldn't feel bad or feel somehow uh, not doing well when you go to see a coach. Because I keep telling people Aaron Rodgers has to see a coach too, right? So the best of us know that coaches uh, make a huge difference in our success. Um, we also will have available our Shared Harvest program if for some reason that you find that um, you need food, um, if you need um, clothing uh, for interviews, we have that available for you. If you have an emergency, such as uh, suddenly your car breaks down or you know have an unexpected expense, we have the ability to help you with those unexpected expenses. Or if you you know have a disruption in childcare, there are ways that we can help you uh, deal with that. All of that is available on campus and available off campus um, and available remotely. So. Um, don't let that don't let that get in your way. Uh, we will uh, help you work through those problems and those issues. I just want to let the participants know that I only have a couple of questions left from those that were emailed in. So if you've thought of a question, go ahead and type that in now um, to make sure that we get to your questions before we end our call. Uh, the next one that I have is the program I'm interested in requires a toolkit. Do I need a toolkit with no risk enrollment? It really depends on your program. For the most part, you're not gonna need it in that first five days. But where you do need some tools, um, we have tools on campus that we will make available to you so that you'll be able to use those and won't miss out on any part of what is going on in your course. Um, and you'll get good feel for that. The next one is how can I register for no risk enrollment? You know, the easiest way is to, if you can go online, uh, just go online and Click right on that scrolling banner on the top for no risk enrollment, it'll get you started. Um, or you can use the chat feature and we'll walk you through it. Or you can call 920-498-5444. And um, there's, we'll, we'll take you right through that process. It's not a difficult process um, and you know we'll help you all the way. And don't forget, um, many of you are going to be eligible for financial aid. And so we can help you get through that process as well. And sometimes it seems daunting, you know, you may have heard about, oh, the FAFSA, that big bad word, the FAFSA. We can help you get through filling out that FAFSA and applying for financial aid. Even if you don't think you're eligible for financial aid, I would encourage you to fill out the FAFSA because once you do that, sometimes you become eligible for other kinds of funds that you were unaware of. And so please make sure you do that. How do I get a student ID? The bookstore says that it's required to rent a textbook. Um, student IDs are made available through um, our student involvement office. Um, but I'm going to ask, let me see, who's best can answer that question in terms of specifically where to go? Hi, Dr. Raffin. Um, when you apply to NWTC or if you're a current student, um, you should have a student ID number and you can use that to access our online services through the bookstore or through your student portal. Um, to get a student ID, you can just give us a call at 498-5444 and we can set up an appointment for you to stop in to get your actual picture. But you don't need the picture. Uh, in order to order the books, just need that number. We'll Correct. Uh, yep. Away. So, you know, um, uh, uh, Dean, uh, Mikey, I, you know, I, you're responsible for general education courses. And I just, frankly, I don't want to learn all that stuff. Okay. I mean, I, I want to, I, I just want to be able to be in the engineering program or I want to be in the digital photography program. Um, tell me, how is that going to work? I mean, I, I realize I got to be able to read and write and I got to be able to do that well enough to communicate, but what's it going to be like in your department? 
Well, thank you for asking, Dr. Effin, and I'm sorry to hear you don't like taking your gen eds. So um, we're going to we're going to change that attitude and make it a little more positive. Um, and the gen ed department faculty are really willing to work with the students. So we have multiple different ways of taking classes. For summer, our microbiology and biology classes will be having their lecture online and they'll be having their labs in person. So that's pretty exciting. Um, for fall, we're looking at bringing science, all science labs uh, back to campus. So um, in that respect, you'll have your lecture will be uh, online and your labs will be in person in most cases. For English comp and um, our, socio our sociology, uh, psychology courses, we'll be looking at bringing uh, students to campus. Um, depending upon the class size and the room size, but faculty are really excited to get back to um, meeting students and providing that general education background that they need. Yeah, um, I know I, I gave you a hard time about, about general education, but it, you know, that's where some really great idea sharing and, and discussion occurs. And, and we work hard to make sure that what you're learning in those general education classes is related to the kinds of careers that you're mm -hmm. going into. So they're not just going to be, you know, about something that you'll never use, but they are very specifically related to the work that you're going to be doing and the kinds of career that you're going to want to follow. So, you, you know, it, it actually is a whole lot better than you think. But you also reminded me that some of you may be thinking you're going to sit out the year or take a gap year. Um, and what I would encourage you to do or to think about that if you're going to do that is come on in and sign up for one or two of those gen ed courses because they're going to be accepted in the university system, um, uh, UW, and they're accepted at almost every private college. Um, it gives you a great way in which to get some credits without um, you know, really taking up your entire year, still gives you the opportunity to work or do the things that you wanted to do in your gap year. So I would encourage you to, to think about doing that as well. And of course, the other thing is, is that you can take a whole um, year's worth of general education credits at a much less cost, and they'll all be accepted at the university and at most of the private colleges. And that's a great way in which to save money um, and at the same time, get an education that's going to allow you to continue that, continue that education to a bachelor's degree. But, you know, I don't, I don't know about you, but frankly, um, after a while, I just get tired of sitting in classes. And, I, you know, so I'm really thinking of uh, going into some of these really laboratory intensive things. And I was wondering if, if Dean Cox could give us an idea about what happens in engineering and trades and heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and carpentry. I mean, how the heck are you going to be delivering that um, when, you know, we're in this COVID environment? My name is Amy Cox. I'm the Dean for Trades and Engineering Technology. And we're working really hard right now with our faculty to make sure that we can offer those hands-on labs to students. Um, like Dr. Raffin said, you don't want your teeth cleaned by somebody who's never actually worked on a human mouth. Well, you don't want your car fixed by somebody who's never actually worked on a car. So we have the luxury of having some really large lab areas. And um, we're looking at how we can uh, get students into those lab areas and maintain those social distancing and give them that hands-on experience that, that we know um, is the way they learn best. We um, actually have our gas and electrical power students coming back um, in the next week or two. Uh, and they'll be doing a lot of their work outside. Um, when they're inside, they'll be in a, a socially distanced atmosphere with masks on. And uh, we're gonna be uh, providing them the same education that we have in the past. We're just doing it in a, in a different way and making sure they get the same education. Great, you know, I noticed uh... Uh, Dean Anderson, who's uh, head of health sciences. I was walking through um, the health sciences building today and I noticed you had a number of students um, already in classes and they were all wearing masks. Um, and, uh, you know, this is a, the, in the field of health sciences. Of course, I would expect they would know why they're wearing masks, but, you know, 
Uh, a lot of times they got to do a lot of close work with uh, patients. I mean, you know, they can't be six feet away. How, how are you going to work through that? Sure. Thank you, Dr. Raffenwell. We, we're going to work through this in a couple of ways. So we do have uh, students that are on campus right now who are currently actually starting new classes, but also finishing up some class experiences that maybe got cut a little bit short in the springtime. So as we have contact or, or situations or students are learning skills when they need to have closer contact than the six feet physical distancing, we are going to increase our, our screening mechanism. So an example, a great example for this will be our dental hygiene clinic. We have a fully operational dental hygiene clinic on campus where our students practice on, on real live patients. So we will be conducting temperature screenings for the students and patients. We'll be having the um, students and patients fill out uh, some screening protocols uh, talking about symptoms. Uh, so we're really going to make it a, a safe as experience as we can. And we're also going to be ramping up our personal protective equipment to the uh, follow the CDC guidelines for the masking and the face shields that we need. So that's, that's pretty much the, what's happening in out in the field when people are out there being a nurse and working with folks uh, uh, in their healthcare profession. So it's not like we're going to be asking the students to do something they won't end up doing all the time anyways, is it? That's correct. We're, we're following um, the exact guidelines that the CDC and all of the accrediting bodies are using for uh, employment standards. So we're, we're looking at those uh, very, very closely and following hospital protocols. Uh, we're using disinfectants that are hospital grade and approved by the EPA. Um, so we're, we're really checking our protocols and making sure we're following everything we need. Yeah. You know, I know, uh, um, uh, Randy, the, uh, our Dean, uh, Randy Smith, uh, in public safety, that sometimes those public safety uh, officers or the EMTs, emerging medical technicians, or the paramedics or firefighters, sometimes they get in some of those close situations as well. Uh, how are you going to be handling that? Uh, thank you, Dr. Raffin. And my name is Randy Smith, I'm the Dean for Public Safety. And much like health, um, health sciences and the nursing program, our paramedics and our and our EMTs, they'll be actually, you know, work with live patients uh, in their clinicals. They are brought on uh, ambulance calls. So that normal PPE, so they're going to um, be required to um, work along side by side with local fire departments and, um, and, and other paramedics. So more than ever, they're going to get really a course and really keeping themselves safe and the general public safe. So. Um, and then in the, in the classrooms, um, uh, of course, physical distancing will be really important. And, um, and one thing that we have learned this spring semester quite quickly, and public safety has primarily been a very hands-on, we put fires out, we, we bring people to hospitals, we, you know, we handcuff people. I mean, it's um, a lot of very close um, and physical contact, but we've also learned to uh, deliver it with a hybrid model with alternative delivery. So that theory-based instruction, we certainly can, uh, are planning on continuing to deliver that to technology. So um, we've adapted well, and we're looking forward to a um, really good summer and fall semesters. Well, uh, thank you for, for sharing that. Uh, clearly, while you were learning how to handcuff people, you've made sure that COVID isn't handcuffing us from delivering that education. So um, I, I do have one other question uh, for Dean Anderson. And I've heard that, um, and I had some friends that uh, were talking about the fact that um, you, the hospitals, uh, nursing uh, areas, I mean, where students do clinicals, that they weren't letting those students in now because they were so busy. Um, what, what's going to happen down the road about that? So, I mean, certainly I, I want to at least see the patients. Good question, Dr. F, and thank you. Um, we are, we, you, you are right. We did when, when COVID first started um, happening back in March, we were uh, actually removed from all of our clinical sites, but those are opening back up now. Um, so the hospitals are, are getting a little bit better uh, grip of the situation and they are allowing students to come back now. So we expect that to open up uh, continually throughout the summer. Um, as well as fall, it might look a little different, 
whereas we used to maybe have a student group of eight students go in a particular uh, section, that might be down to four, and we would then supplement that learning with simulation in our, our nursing simulation center or in our, our labs. Um, but we do have a plan and we've also been working with all of our accrediting bodies to um, really understand what we need for clinical and, and how we need to check students off on those skills. Yeah, I've seen some of those simulation, uh, I guess you would call them robots, although they look like real people. And it, it's, it's really interesting uh, when you see what they can go through. And in fact, in many cases, I hear students are able to experience things that they actually um, may never see in the clinical, but once they get into that job, may see maybe once or twice a year. And so having that opportunity to work in that simulated environment made a big difference in terms of their ability to respond. Um, so it's kind of cool. We have another student question. Um, will there be any changes to living in the campus dorms? Yeah, the campus dorms are actually operated by a third party. They are not actually on our property, even though it looks like that. Um, and right now they are going through and making the changes to make sure that they are staying clean um, and that they have all of the safety protocols in place. Um, so, but the activities that uh, students engage in, um, the resources they have available to them when they're living in those, uh, in that housing, uh, they will continue to have. And that wraps up all the questions that we have from, from anyone who's a participant, unless anyone has one last minute question they want to quickly type in. Well, I never gave an opportunity for um, our Vice President for Student Services, Colleen Simpson, uh, to talk about all of the exciting things that go on in student services, although we've talked quite a bit about it. But Colleen, do you have anything to share with us? Yes, thank you very much, Dr. Raffin. One of the things I want to remind all of our new and prospective students out there is that we're here to make sure that you will be successful this upcoming fall semester. And we have an amazing team of student services employees that are in the virtual world who are creating a seamless experience for you. And so I'm encouraging you, if you have any question, reach out to our chat reach out to our call center and our team is here to assist you and answer any question. And just remember, there's no question that is, is not, no question that's stupid. Just be prepared to ask the question and we'll be here to provide the service and the support for you. And um, today it's virtual quick start. So I'm gonna put a plug in there so that after you have heard all the great things we're doing here through our community forum, you should just log out, jump on our website and apply to NWTC. Thank you. Yeah, I, I don't quite know what happens at a virtual quick start. Uh, you know, those are two words I'm not really familiar with, virtual and quick start. My, can you tell me a little bit what's gonna happen if I give you a call? Aaron, I'm gonna let you lead this away. This is your brainchild. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. So what happens on a virtual quick start is we have admissions advisors on, on call right now virtually to help answer any questions that you have, to help you through that application process, um, to answer some of the questions. And you right when you apply, you actually get assigned to a representative at the college and they can help you walk you through each process that you have here at NWTC to get started. So I encourage you to fill out that application online. You'll get assigned to an individual that will help you walk through what it's like to apply for college, go through options for paying for college, and maybe some of those resources or concerns that you have about getting started here this fall, we can connect you through those individuals here at NWTC to help you understand what our fall semester will look like and help you get comfortable at starting. Yeah, well, I'm glad to hear that because sometimes it can be such, it seems like such a daunting or complicated process to, to do that. I know that uh, even as a parent, and I've tried to help my own sons uh, through that application process, uh, it, can be, uh, it can be pretty scary if you've never been through it before. So. Yeah, we are here every step of the way to help walk you through that by by chat, by text, by phone call, um, any method, just reach out to us. Yeah. And if you don't have some information that we need you to have, 
we'll help you get that or we'll help you figure out where to get it. So don't let that stop you either. Sometimes, uh, you know, you don't realize you need something, but um, or sometimes, you know, you don't and you think, well, I'm not going to call because I don't have this and that and that and the other. Um, I would give you um, I would suggest to you go ahead and call because sometimes we can really help work through that process as well. Remember, this is no risk, uh, no risk. So reserve your spot today. Make sure uh, that you are going to be in a position to be able to take those classes and get the education that's going to make a huge difference in your life and the life of those around you. We have one new question. Oh. If a student shows up to campus without a mask, will one be provided? Yes, um, we are. We will have masks. They'll be disposable masks, so you know it'll work for you for the day. Um, but of course, we would encourage you as a student uh, eventually to get uh, a mask. Really, what we're talking about is a face covering. Some people you've probably seen already when you're out, they'll have masks, or some people have bandanas. Um, but a mask makes a huge difference in terms of um, whether or not um, you're going to inadvertently pass on that virus or from getting that virus. So we'll make sure that uh, you have a mask if you come uh, to the campus. I will say though, if you come to the campus and you're sick, we're gonna send you home. So um, not, not in a way that's a, a penalty and we'll certainly be able to help you get through your courses. But uh, we're, you know, which, which means of course, if I somehow get sick, I'm going to have to stay home. Uh, something I'm not used to doing, but that's, I think that's the new world we live in. I think that wraps up all of our questions. Great. Well, I look forward to seeing you. Um, I look forward to, you know, hearing about you. Um, and, you know, please take advantage of that no risk option. What do you got to lose? You have everything to gain and absolutely nothing to lose. Looking forward to this fall and this summer and saying hello. Thank you all for attending.